Welcome to Aircrew Interview, I'm Mike King, your host, and this is part one of our interview with former Pakistan fighter pilot Kaiser Tufel. In this episode, Kaiser chats about what it was like to fly the FT-5, the F-6, the Mirage F-1 and the Mirage 3. If you enjoy our videos and podcasts and would like us to continue putting out regular quality content, head over to patreon.com forward slash aircrew interview where you can donate monthly and in return you will get rewards ranging from early interview viewings, bonus clips, credited as a producer and much more. Thank you and enjoy. So Kaiser, when did you first become interested in aviation? Well, my father was in the army, so he was wearing a uniform. A cousin of mine was in the Air Force, an uncle of mine was in the Air Force. So obviously at a young age, it was impressionable and, uh, you know, I would have donned a uniform too. Uh, but then we used to attend uh, these uh, National Day parades on which uh, we had the fly past and we had the roaring F-104 Starfighter. Wow. And the lead aircraft was the chief of the uh, air staff or the commander in chief at that time. And he would just come in at treetop level and roar at nearly supersonic speeds. And then there'd be a loud boom. And that just fascinated me no end. I wanted to do that. You know, no. I'm talking about age uh, 10, 11, 12, around that time. And then I got a lucky break at the Cadet College. Uh, it's a military school. It's a high school. Uh, they take you in at class eight and mm -hmm. stay on for five years till you finish your high school. So uh, again, I wore the uniform after seeing my father at th age 13, of course, I was in uniform. That was a military school, army school, actually. Okay. And out of our class of about 80, uh, about 25 joined the army and the rest were in the civil the medical colleges or the engineering universities. And I was the only one who joined uh, the Air Force out <laughs> of 80. Yeah. Uh, not too many applied because uh, everyone thought that uh, there were two chances to join the armed forces. Mm -hmm. And if you just lose one, uh, the Air Force, you left with just one for the army. So I took a chance in their awards. I got selected. That was 1973. 1973, right. And 73, and then we had one year boot camp at a hill station uh, away from the academy. The academy was essentially just about flying. Uh, so the boot camp for one year in the remaining one and a half year at the academy where we did both uh, aeronautical studies as well as uh, flying. So half the day we were in the classrooms and the other half we were in the flight lines and alternate the next day the other way around. Yeah, so, yeah, tell us some of the, the first aircraft you started training on, your basic aircraft. Right. Uh, after completing one and a half year of uh, ground training, we were put through flight training, which uh, used to take one year, six months of the primary and six months of the basic training. Mm -hmm. The primary training used to be on the T6G Harvard. Ah, lovely aircraft. Yeah, the Texan, yeah. Uh, so we started off on the Texan, the Harvard, and uh, about just short of solo, uh, short of solo stage, uh, they discovered that the aircraft had some major structural defects. Okay. And they had to ground half of them, half the fleet. Wow. About uh, 40 odd aircraft, 20 were grounded. So the other squadron, not my squadron, the other squadron uh, continued to fly on the Howards. And we were just lucky to have the uh, Saab supporter, the MFI 17, mm -hmm. uh, the Swedish aircraft primary trainer. Uh, they sold five to us, uh, sort of experimental thing that if you like it, you keep it. If you don't, you just uh, turn it back. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, our squadron was put on those five aircraft. So uh, I just flew about eight or 10 hours on the Harvard, just about, you know, about to get the solo. Uh, we were with the aircraft grounded and we were put on the supporter. Uh, and uh, it was a breeze. Uh, <laughs> the Texan had 600 horsepower and here we were on a nose wheel aircraft. Uh, 200 horsepower. It was more like a toy. Very comfortable, no <laughs> problem at all. Uh, so, of course, uh, we did about 55 hours on the uh, MFI 17. Mm -hmm. uh, and the phases were basic aerobatics and uh, the circuit landings and uh, navigation. No instrument, no aerobat uh, no uh, formation. Mm -hmm. It was about 55 hours. And then from there, we graduated from the primary to the basic flying training wing. And we had the T-37s. There. And, T37s, uh, yeah. yeah. And finally, uh, with about uh, 170 or 180 hours, 
we graduated. Uh, and let me tell you about the number of people who joined. We were 55 who joined the academy out of a total of 5,000. The initial selection was out of 5,000 candidates, and we were just 55 who got to the academy in 1973. Wow. Yeah, and 29 graduated. The rest, uh, about 40%, were just weeded out. It's like well in the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> it was. <laughs> and from there, uh, the usual stream was uh, after T T37, uh, people used to go to the T33 for uh, advanced jet conversion at a different pace. You were done with the academy and you'd go to the uh, conversion school. And now uh, T33 is again uh, aging and uh, there weren't enough of them. So again, the split up goes into two halves one on the T33. Uh, and those guys were supposed to follow it up with the F-86 in that stream, American stream. Mm -hmm. And the other half were sent to the MiG-17 dual-seater, which had just arrived as a replacement of the T-33, mm -hmm. which was in the last phases anyway. So we were, again, the lucky ones. Lucky, I'd say, because there was a new aircraft, um, very simple to fly, very easy, no vices. And uh, so there we started uh, in the boondocks. This was the base. Uh, ours was the first course, and that was the base, uh, you know, starting operations for the first time, way back mm -hmm. in 1976. So uh, we got on to uh, the make. Like I said, it was a very MiG-17 dual seater. It was a very simple aircraft. The engine was very reliable. But, uh, I had a smooth sailing on the MiG-17 on the on the FT. We used to call it the FT-5, fighter trainer number five. That the yeah. Chinese days of the dual seat. Yeah. And that was the only dual seat MiG-17 made by China. The Russians, they continued on the MiG-15 uh, UTI, mm -hmm. yeah. which we had three anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, before the MiG-17, we had the uh, MiG-15 mm -hmm. UTI. Just mm -hmm. a few of them, only for instrument flying in for uh, night checkouts and so on. We mm -hmm. didn't have the F-6, the MiG-19, uh, the dual seater hadn't come in at that time. So now from MiG-17, we moved on to the MiG-15. Now, from there, we uh, graduated on to uh, the F seven, F sixes, the Wing nineteen. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the Wing nineteen, like I told you, uh, this was nineteen seventy six, and till then, we had in the Pakistan Air Force hadn't got the dual seat uh, Wing nineteen. Mm -hmm. I think in I think nineteen eighty one or eighty two. So, uh, what we had to do was uh, get familiar with the Chinese instruments and the layout, which was pretty much the same on the Mix fifteen. Mm -hmm. The performance was totally different. Mm -hmm. performance was more like the uh, FT-5, the MiG-17, mm -hmm. but the idea of uh, these checkouts were just to get familiar, way to look for the speed indicator, way to look for the uh, altimeter and so on, just that. The speeds were different, the MiG-15 was much slower, the MiG-19 was way faster. So three sorties, I think, and uh, there we were, uh, you know, uh, ready to go solo without any dual instruction, which is quite something. And we've had cases where people have taken off, had taken off uh, in military power, in uh, rated power, in afterburner by mistake. They're just pressing <laughs> the wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, the people who had exceeded the speed, the gear uh, limit just after takeoff because the aircraft, they, they touched the afterburner button mm -hmm. and it sped up. The people who actually, uh, were, while moving the throttle, the left throttle could be moved with one finger. It was just, you know, it was about. Uh, a centimeter wide, okay. and the right part, the right part of the throttle was a uh, good about you know, three or four inches long. Uh, so it was quite uh, differential. And there are people who left, who who left the left engine where it was, like idle, and just shoved in the right one. And they had a vicious yaw, and they discovered that both the engines and both the uh, throttles weren't linked properly. There was a little latch. Ah, uh, yeah. Back. All kinds of funny things which happened. Uh, now about the aircraft, it was very fast, extremely fast. Uh, the wings were highly swept, I think in about 55 degrees or so, which is quite a sweep. That is, yes. And that, that, yeah, that carries a lot of adverse characteristics, uh, like uh, adverse yaw was a real bad thing, you're turning left, and the aircraft, if you are uh, not, if it was in a balanced turn, the ball was in the center, the aircraft would just flick on the other side and actually into a spin. Okay. So 
And it, we lost quite a few aircraft in spins. Mm. In, at slow speeds, uh, you know, get into an adverse yaw and spin out, or in the base turn, coming for landing, the speeds were very slow on the margin, just at the edge of the uh, envelope, mm -hmm. and uh, tight turn, the spin out over there. And unfortunately, till till we started flying, we didn't have the Martin Baker seat, we had the Chinese seat. Uh -huh. And uh, if I recall, the limits were something like uh, 700 feet to 800 feet was the minimum. You couldn't uh, eject on the ground or lower than that. Mm -hmm. And the speed limit was something like uh, 200 kilometers per hour. Right. Okay. Faster. Until uh, we reported to the fighter squadron after graduating from the conversion unit, when we reached the fighter squadron, uh, luckily the seats had been changed, and now we are on the Martin Baker zero zero seat. Mm -hmm. That made a huge difference, and uh, saved saved a lot of lives. But uh, it sounds like you had a great time on the MiGs there. But let's move on to what was your first frontline Western aircraft and what was it like to fly and how different was it coming from, you know, the Chinese or Russian made aircraft? Well, uh, a step back after staying about one and a half year in the fighter squadron, uh, where I accumulated close to 300 hours, which is quite a lot for about uh, 15 months of flying, because mm -hmm. the flying time of the MiG was barely about 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. Total flight time was 40 minutes uh, with tax. With clean, you could barely do about 25, 30. <laughs> really? Uh, yeah. So uh, after that, there was some shortage of instructors at the academy. So they pulled out we youngsters uh, with, I was just a flying officer at the time with, uh, I think, barely two years service. I was not yet 24 when they sent me as an instructor. Wow. Not yet 24 as an instructor at the academy. Did the instructor's course on the T-37 and I stayed on the T-37 as an instructor for nearly four years, about a little less than four years. I got a lucky break there because I joined the aerobatics team, the shared bills or the lion hearts as they call it. Uh, so uh, stayed on, that was quite something because we were, uh, we used to perform on graduations at the academy. It wasn't the Air, Air Force aerobatics team, it was just the academy team, but since that was the only regular team, so uh, on VIP visits or uh, some f annual festivals or fairs or parades, we used to go there and uh, at the academy. So it was quite something for stu a student to claim that my instructor is uh, you know, uh, part of the aerobatics team and so on. And like I told you, I was quite young, I was barely 24. And my first student when he graduated, uh, his parents were there in the graduation parade and I went up during the tea party, I went up to them to congratulate them. And they said, congratulations to you also. I said, what for? They said, you've graduated. I said, no, I graduated four years back. I'm an <laughs> instructor. I didn't believe that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, so after four years, I moved on. Uh, from there, uh, the next best aircraft, we just had two types of fighters, the F-6 and the Mirage. So from there, I moved on to the Mirages. Now, this was quite something. Because firstly, there was a gap of nearly four years that I had last flown a fighter. Mm -hmm. And secondly, this was a tailless Delta, which is uh, very different. The flying characteristics are quite different from the swept wing aircraft, although the F-6 was difficult too. But this one, I wouldn't say it's difficult, but it was different. You had to understand how a Delta behaves because uh, there's so many things about a Delta. You Each time you you know pull the L1, you pull on the stick with the L1 going up, uh, you want the aircraft to go up, but actually you induce a lot of drag. So mm -hmm. that makes you actually, uh, you know, lose lift, lose the speed. So you had to understand that. And because of that uh, characteristic, you had to have very high speeds for takeoff and landing, which is a peculiar thing of the deltas. Deltas also happen to have very uh, poor aspect ratio. That's the square of the wingspan over the wing area. Um, in fact, Mirage, uh, has perhaps the world's worst aspect ratio. I think the Draken, Swedish Draken beats it, but uh, the Mirage 3 and 5, and perhaps also uh, the 102 and 106s being tailless deltas, they all had aspect ratios in the region of about 1.8, 1.85 or so. It was really low. Wow. Compared that to the 816, which is something like 3.5, uh, almost double of that. Uh, but uh, the cake is taken by the Indian Tejas, 
which is a delta wing TLS aircraft, 1.75, really low aspect ratio. But then, of course, it has fly by wire controls which take care of uh, some of these. But since the Mirages were, weren't fly by controls and there weren't any flight control computers to limit it uh, from certain uh, idiosyncrasies, so to speak, so the pilot had to handle it. Uh, you know. So uh, the basic issue was uh, high speed, very high speed uh, on takeoff and very high speed on landing. Uh, I, if I recall correctly, the uh, landing speed of the space shuttle was something like 220 knots. And here we were at 195, 200 knots. Wow. So that's, yeah, one of the fa fastest fighters to come in for a landing. Yeah, that so, is high. So you had to be real fast in takeoff and landing to be able to react to even a sudden red light coming on. You didn't have too much margin. By the time you realize that a red light has come on, it means fire or it means this or that. Either you take off or you stop because everything happens so fast. Mm -hmm. So you had to be at the uh, power curve, so to speak, uh, because uh, it wasn't forgiving in these phases of flight. To but was it a nice to... aircraft to actually handle and fly itself? Did it have, was it mainly a, a good aircraft? Would... Given the fact that it first flew in 1956 mm -hmm. and the technology was that uh, early, uh, it was very good. Actually, it had an uh, auto command system, it had an orthodox uh, kind of auth autopilot. Uh, it had adverse characteristics like all deltas have. It wasn't peculiar to uh, the Mirage only. All tailless deltas have similar problems, but there are not too many delta, uh, tailless delta types anyway. There was a one or two, one or six, and I think the Draken and the Mirage, these were some of the few uh, tailless delta aircraft. Mm -hmm. So they had these uh, issues. Also, the other issue was that uh, because of the delta and because the LA1 going up when you wanted to climb and you're actually inducing drag and uh, spoiling the lift. So therefore, you'd lose lift very fast. If you're turning, uh, again, because of induced drag, you'd uh, lose a lot of lift. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a good aircraft to fly like we used to on the F6, be at uh, very, very low speeds. You know, less than 100 kilometers per hour also. Wow. We used to have the speeds in KPH on the uh, Chinese types. Mm -hmm. On the Mirage, you can do uh, such a thing because although it won't go into a spin, but it'll just keep coming down, uh, it'll keep losing height. Mm -hmm. uh, energy maintenance was a major issue. But since the aerodynamics otherwise were very good, meant for high-speed flight, it was excellent, superb at uh, high speeds. Mm -hmm. And... Despite the fact that it was underpowered, rather underpowered, I would say, um, F6, the Chinese uh, MiG-19, was uh, close to 0.86 thrust to weight ratio. And the Mirage was uh, barely 0.6 or something. Yeah, yeah so, that's a significant yeah, difference. Not a difference in the thrust to weight ratio. So uh, it, couldn't sustain, it couldn't sustain speeds during uh, turn, a turning fight. So the mm -hmm. best thing was if you got into a turning, if you got into an air combat situation, better run. <laughs> that was the best escape thing. Because yeah. if you wanted to fight it out, you definitely lose mm -hmm. against virtually any. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what was actually the the Mirage uh, three uh, used for in the PAF, uh, the um, Pakistan Air Force? Was it mainly air to air, air to ground, or a bit of both? So it was a very versatile aircraft, but a few, of course, the F-16 was a complete, uh, completely uh, multi-role aircraft, but so was the Mirage. For its time, it could do air defense. It had uh, the first batch, had the Serrano uh, 2 radar, not a very good radar in the sense that it was a Doppler radar. Yeah. And look down capability wasn't there, but uh, look up was reasonable, again, for its time, pick up about 20 miles or so. Um, that... Then uh, it would carry rockets, it could carry bombs, uh, it could do dive bombing, it could do level bombing, uh, quite a variety of stores. And the squadron that I flew in for most of my time was in the maritime attack role. We had the Exocet uh, uh, hooked up on the uh, Mirage and carry out uh, A to C anti maritime, uh, in the anti maritime role. Mm -hmm. So, quite a few missions actually, and air defense alert. Virtually the whole gamut of operations was, uh, this was the workhorse, the linchpin of the Air Force for mm -hmm. quite some time, yes. And in war, I think, although I didn't participate in any war, but it had a reasonably good record also in yeah, war. Yeah, I read that, yeah. Shooting down aircraft and bomb delivery and so on and so forth. 
then the variety of weapons it had. I missed out the Durandal. That was a main role of the uh, Mirage, carrying the Durandal for anti-runway strikes. Mm -hmm. So it was a very versatile aircraft. So we used it for almost every uh, role in the Pakistan Air Force. Uh, there weren't any specialist squadrons. I mean, you could have an exocet, but that didn't mean you were just a maritime squadron. Uh, maritime was just one speciality you had to be proficient in, but the rest of the roles, you had to do air combat, you had to do close support, ground attack, bombing, everything else, plus exocet. Similarly, any other squadron, like uh, the rest squadron would have the flare pod, everything else, plus the flare night uh, attack capability that you had to be proficient in and so on. So, uh, thrown virtually every mission on the Mirage. So, it's certainly a multi-role aircraft, and especially for that time, it's uh, a pretty uh, diverse aircraft. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and um, obviously, this is the first time, uh, I, I want to know why uh, the Pakistan Air Force went for a French-manufactured uh, aircraft. What, was there a reason for that? Uh, was there a partnership there? Because, um, let me just count. This is, right now, the eighth American sanction on the Pakistan Armed Forces. Right now, we are under the eighth sanction. Oh. And the first one was immediately after the 1965 war when we were just flying the F 104s and the F 86s. And we had been sanctioned. So now we had to look for some other aircraft which are non American. So Mirage was one type, of course, we got. And we did get the F 86. Uh, the Canadian F-86s being flown by the Luftwaffe and they had uh, grounded them and we had Iran buy them for us. So, it, you know, because the Congress just wanted to look the other way. They didn't want to uh, want us to buy it directly because we wanted sanctions. So uh, it was these uh, Canadian built with Luftwaffe, which was sold to Iran and Iran palmed them off to us. Mm -hmm. That's how we got the second batch of the F-86, which we started to call F-86E, mm -hmm. E in the Pakistan Air Force. Otherwise, we had the Fs before that. Mm -hmm. And along with that, alongside that, we got the Mirages and we got the F-6s about the same time, yeah. 1966 and 7. And then obviously, you also uh, flew the Mirage F-1. This is a really intriguing aircraft. Can you tell us a bit about what it was like to fly and how different was it from the Mirage 3? Yeah, uh, a batch of four of us went to Qatar with the Qatari Air Force because they didn't have in enough instructors. So they called uh, us over there. And uh, I was very lucky to have, before that, of course, I had flown uh, the F-16 mm -hmm. before the uh, Mirage F-1. Okay. So I had that background, yeah. But then switching from the F-16, which was a different class of aircraft altogether in every way, Getting back on the F-16, but then uh, on the on the Mirage F-1, uh, this, as you know, was a swept wing aircraft, exactly the same size, the length and the wingspan, more or less uh, like the Mirage. But uh, some of the things that were peculiar to it, it had leading, leading edge flaps, uh, so a high lift, and didn't have uh, it had a separate tail, so there was no washing off of uh, the lift because uh, of the early one, like the uh, tailless deltas, so that wasn't a problem at all. It had loads of fuel. Uh, it had actually more internal fuel than the F-16. Variety of weapons on the wings. It had, unlike the Mirage 3, which had, or 3 or 5, which had just two wing stations each, this one had three, and then it had a central line station, which could have four bombs. It was a canted V uh, kind of uh, pylon on the central line station, and Four bombs, two forward and two. So uh, quite a load of bombs. It could carry bombs and rockets and so on. And it had a number of pods. The Qataris had bought all kinds of, uh, you know, ancillary stuff with it, like the ECM pods, the Gemma pods. Mm -hmm. uh, so a uh, pretty modern aircraft for the time. But we enjoyed, because of the size of the country, uh, we're going to do long strikes. It's a very small country, Qatar. Mm -hmm. So most of our time used to be air defense. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a bit about that because I'm interested to see how did the F uh, Mirage F1 fare in a uh, dogfight or DACT against the other types at the time? Uh, like, what was it like? Other types, uh, like 
like, like uh, F16, um, the Mirage 3, how to defend a dogfight no type situation? No, no, no match, uh, the F16, nothing can match really, or nothing <laughs> could match at that, at that time. Yeah. Until that time, uh, the F-16 was, and I still think it's one of the most, uh, purely from a dogfight standpoint, it's, it's, it was designed for a dogfight, really. Mm. The F-1, one of what I felt was that having flown both these aircraft, the uh, F-6 and the uh, Mirages, Pakistan Air Force Mirages, uh, Mirage 5s and 3s, uh, they had some kinks. You had to be very careful. You couldn't take liberties in certain Phases of flight, like I told you, for the Mirage, you had to be very careful at takeoff and landing yep. and extremely low speeds. And the F6 in the base turn at low speed. And, uh, you know, if you're not careful while turning in air combat, even pulling, suddenly pulling so many Gs at low speeds, it would just flick on the opposite side. That problem wasn't there at all. Mm -hmm. Aerodynamically safe, it was really stable. No problems at all. In fact, I recall having gone less than 100 knots many times without any problem. No adverse yaw. You just had to sort of nurse it. It would lose a bit of height, but nothing dangerous at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I flew for three years and uh, never faced any situation where I would spin out or I would stall or I was close to this or that, nothing. Did it have um, an so underpowered really, engine like the Mirage 3 or was it? Yeah, it was underpowered. They, mm -hmm. uh, if I recall the Mirage uh, 5 was thrust to weight 0.62 and this was 0.66. Yeah, so similar, one was yeah. one, so not much of difference. Mm -hmm. uh, I do know that the M53-2 uh, version of the Mirage 2000 was tried on uh, the F1. Mm -hmm. uh, but it didn't attract any customers because by the time the Mirage was uh, Mirage 2000 was on offer. So there's no point buying a Mirage F1 uh, with a new engine. You'd rather go, and many countries did go for the Mirage 2000, then have an upgraded Mirage at a time when the Mirage 2000 was available. It was a viceless aircraft, no issues at all. Uh, it had an excellent uh, autopilot, just like a commercial aircraft, and we could do uh, low altitude, very low altitude, as, as low as about uh, 300 feet and 500 feet over the sea at night uh, interceptions. There was no problem because uh, I recall during my three years stay over there, I never made a uh, maintenance fault entry uh, on the autopilot, never. Wow. I do not recall the circuit breaker popping out, some light coming on, nothing. That's an Perhaps impressive record. Recovery. Yeah, very impressive record. Yeah. And similarly, the engine was extremely reliable. Uh, it was uh, m more or less the same engine with more thrust, uh, like the Mirage, the Mirage, uh, Three and five have the 9C, HR 9C, and this one had the 9K, a 1,000 kilograms more uh, thrust. Otherwise, basically, it was more or less the same. Mm -hmm. The way it worked was the same. So no issues on that. Uh, one thing the Mirage 5 couldn't do was uh, flame out pattern. It couldn't glide. I mean, there's no engine. You come down like a stone. <laughs> that didn't happen on the Mirage 1. On the Mirage 1, you could glide, actually. It had a reasonable glide ratio. Okay. And I do recall uh, doing some uh, flame out patterns, practice patterns. And uh, since the landing and takeoff speeds were very slow, uh, we had the drag chute, but we never used it. In fact, we were supposed to use the drag chute once a month just to check the functionality of the system. Otherwise, routinely, we weren't using the drag chute. Right. And the uh, landing speed was just a shade higher than the T-37. Really? Yeah. Despite being a fighter. Uh, the T-37 no flap was about 125 knots mm -hmm. and the Mirage F1 was 135 knots uh, final approach speed 135 yeah. to 40 depending on the weight that you were carrying yeah so again it was very controllable and the fact that uh, we had I think the world's second largest second longest runway in Doha in Qatar wow. which was also the emergency landing runway for the space shuttle how was it if there was bad yeah, if there was bad weather uh, in America and it was, it had to land, uh, so it could. This was one of the alternate airfields for the space shuttle. Wow. It was uh, thirty thousand feet, twelve thousand eight hundred feet or so, uh, fairly long. The usual military runways are nine thousand feet. Yeah, and uh, we we just cleared off from the first link uh, because the aircraft was slow down. It was quite windy in uh, Doha. Mm -hmm. uh, it was on the coast, you know, sea breeze, so stopping the aircraft was no issue. Mm -hmm. 
And seldom we had to use brakes other than just having to turn off. So on the whole, a very comfortable, very easy aircraft uh, to fly. Lots of capabilities uh, for the 80s and for the early 90s, about that time. Mm -hmm. Beyond that stage, then of course, uh, you know, better fighters had uh, come in. The class of the Mirai 2000, the 16 uh, in the early 80s and mid 80s and beyond. Yeah. So it became sort of redundant. I think it was the wrong aircraft at the wrong time. It, it had come out about five to ten years earlier. It could have uh, had sales like uh, the Mirage 5 and 3, which went up to about 50, 1,400 units. Mm -hmm. And this one, I think, was not more than 700 or so. Mm -hmm. And also to note, a very beautiful aircraft. Yes, yeah, very beautiful aircraft.